Hello, and welcome to everyone who is joining us for our final session this fall of the Profiles in the Justice Profession series. I'm Rachel Strober with Pearson. I'm going to cover just a few small housekeeping items before we jump into our webinar this afternoon. We are recording this session. Captions have been enabled and you can turn them on and off using the Zoom controls. The chat function is on and we do encourage you to use it. We will be opening up the floor to audience questions for the second half of our conversation. And with that said, I am very excited to introduce you to our host today, Frank Schmeliger, and our guest of honor, Director Ryan Thornell. Ryan Thornell is the director of the Arizona Department of Corrections, Rehabilitation and Reentry. He has nearly two decades of extensive correctional leadership and experience and is a well-known, respected and innovative leader of the modernization of corrections. His commitment to the field focuses on enhancing public safety by promoting systems-wide engagement, creating widespread access to services and resources, and improving the overall wellness of the department, including its correction staff and those under the ADCRR's care and supervision. Dr. Frank Schmeliger is a distinguished professor at the University of North Carolina at Pembroke. He holds degrees from the University of Notre Dame and the Ohio State University, having earned both a master's and a doctorate in sociology from the Ohio State University with a special emphasis in criminology. For 20 years, he taught criminology and criminal justice courses at the University of North Carolina, and for the last 16 of those years, he chaired the university's Department of Sociology, Social Work, and Criminal Justice. The university named him Distinguished Professor in 1991. Frank Schmoliger is the author of numerous articles and more than 40 books, his most recent being the 17th edition of Criminal Justice Today. Frank, Ryan, welcome. We're so happy to have you with us. And Frank, I will turn the conversation over to you. Thank you, Rachel. And hello, Director Thornell. Hi, it's great to be with you today. Well, it's truly an honor to have you here today. I've, I've followed your meteoric career rise within the corrections field over the past decade or so. And it's obvious that other people also recognize your, your hard work, uh, your brilliance, and your potential. So I'm very happy to have you here with us today. But let's begin with a few questions. I'm particularly interested in your work in corrections. What's your story? How did you start? What was the path that led you to where you are today? Well, again, thank you for uh, for letting me be a part of the conversation uh, with you today. Um, it's great to, to really step aside from the day-to-day -day work and, and engage in good conversation about corrections. Um, you know, for me, um, it, it's it's really a, a story of, I was an undergraduate student at a uh, small private school, University of Sioux Falls in uh, South Dakota, and I uh, was a criminal justice student. Um, and so for the summer, I decided that at the age of 19, I was going to uh, try out being a correctional officer at the South Dakota State Penitentiary. Um, and that's really what was what my foot in the door was uh, that led to my career in corrections and really gave me my start. And, and so what I found myself doing was gaining this experience while I was going to school for my undergraduate degree um, to just try to better understand the field of criminal justice. Uh, I had no intentions of uh, no interest in a career in corrections at the time. It really was just that, just trying to learn. Um, but I, I became hooked really quickly um, over the next three, really about three and a half years um, while I finished up my degree, I worked with the South Dakota Department of Corrections that entire time, uh, both uh, in the institution, but also in parole. Um, it had the opportunity to really learn from a set of leaders uh, who were starting to challenge the, the status quo of, the, of that time. Um, you know, ideas like evidence-based practices and things were becoming catchphrases and new ideas to the field. And so I, I almost had like a first uh, front row uh, seat to learn and grow and, and explore those ideas. Um, and that led me to uh, a decision to attend graduate school at the University of Cincinnati. 
where um, my entire thinking around criminal justice and corrections changed, um, became much more evidence-based, much more research-based. Um, and it, it really allowed me to think about situations and problems differently. And that's really where my connection, long-term connection into corrections grew from. So uh, you've answered, uh, I think, my second question uh, to a large degree already. But uh, when you went from being a student to being a professional, how did you take the first few steps in the field? And especially what was it that, that drew you into the field? Was it uh, evidence-based corrections, as you say, or was it the uh, face-to-face -face work with, uh, with folks who were already in the system? Or, or what would you say? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, and I think it's really a combination of things. Um, you know, for me, it, it was really about making an investment in the learning of the field, uh, which is really what helped me become, you know, make that transition from student to professional. Um, you know, really, I will always consider myself to be a student of the field, uh, constantly learning about corrections and what's happening and what needs to be happening. Uh, but there's really, you know, points in time where you shift from kind of the traditional sense of a student and become more of a professional focused uh, person in, in whatever craft you're in. And um, for me, you know, what really helped me do that is, you know, connecting to a mentor in the field uh, who can start helping you think differently, um, you know, but additionally, you really have to, for me, I really had to start taking risks. Um, and, you know, as it relates to student to professional, you know, stepping outside of your traditional comfort zone and, and box, so to speak, and um, being willing to relocate for opportunities and really putting your name out for potential. Um, that's really what has kept me in the field of corrections and allowed me to grow into kind of the professional path that I have. Um, and, you know, as we talk about corrections, it's a field ripe with potential. Uh, we have the potential to really try things differently, to try to get better outcomes. You know, we have the potential to pursue a whole different type of impact um, on staff, the incarcerated population in our communities. And what, what really keeps me interested in the field as a professional today really is this idea of the potential to really think about public safety differently and really how we impact public safety differently. Um, and so that, that's really what has, um, you know, helped me, you know, go from being a student to, to being a professional is really recognizing that potential. And that's, what's kept me uh, in the, in the field is drawing on that potential, really the excitement around it, the excitement for new opportunities and really pushing the, the boundaries of the status quo. We have a lot of uh, students in the audience today. So can you tell me, has the process to enter the corrections field changed in recent years? And uh, what should they do if they if they want to work in corrections? Yeah, it's, it's uh, much, much like everything else. Uh, you know, as we've entered into the 21st century, uh, we've had to change. Uh, we've had to change with the times and the population and the demographics. Um, you know, the, the real nuts and bolts of entering the field have largely stayed the same in terms of, you know, entry points being, you know, corrections officers or probation or parole officers, sort of those entry level, line level positions. Those are available most often to 18 to 21 year olds, um, kind of as the first step into the field, um, you know, and, and college students come into a position like that really with a uh, um, an accelerated track because there's a level of education that accompanies them um, stepping into a, a frontline position like that. Um, but really the way that we recruit people, the way that we seek to retain people has shifted. It's had to shift over the last um, several decades. Um, we've really understood better as an industry, the value of education um, and what diversity in terms of perspective that brings um, the different communication skill sets and interaction skill sets that education brings with it. Um, and we've also really started to better understand the impact of what I would consider to be the diversity of assignment. So, you know, previously when you would enter into the field of corrections, you would start out as a corrections officer and then 
you know, much like the military, you would simply promote one rank to the next, to the next, to the next, up until you earn enough stripes to really be at kind of that highest level. Um, what we've really better understood more recently is the value in diversity in terms of background and experience. And so, you know, you can now uh, make it far in the field of corrections when you go from a corrections officer and then maybe you dabble over into some sort of case management, social work aspect of corrections. And then maybe you jump into some of the law enforcement work that we have in corrections. You know, there's also business and human resources sides of things. And, and that just brings a whole different sort of um, staff member and it gives a much different uh, you know approach more well-rounded approach to the topic of corrections and it, so we've started placing a lot more emphasis on that um, versus the traditional just hierarchical rise through through the ranks um, and we've also really started to become much more uh, engaged with and accepting of you know what I would consider to be people that that come from the outside and challenge the status quo, bringing a, a different perspective. You know, myself, I've, I've worked in uh, uh, four different states now. So I, I've become used to kind of being the outsider in the conversation, but it's given me a leg up in some ways because it's allowed me to bring in that external perspective, um, which has become much more valuable in the field. And in terms of uh, your own story, what obstacles did you encounter in your career and how did you overcome them? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, the obstacles, you know, we each encounter some, some are general, some are unique. Um, you know, for me personally, um, some of the, the kind of the constant obstacle that, that I've run into that I've worked to, to break through is really just the, the industry culture. Um, every corrections agency, no matter what state, what part of the country has its own distinct culture. Um, and oftentimes we find that that culture, number one, is not as accepting as out of outsiders, uh, but two, doesn't necessarily always want to change with the times. Um, and I'm, I'm really polar opposite of that, where I really push, um, push change, push the challenge, the status quo. And so I, I found myself uh, butting up into some some of those culture differences, uh, organizational culture differences. Um, you know, and I've also, you know, personally, um, you know, battled, encountered uh, obstacles associated with my age. You know, it's, I don't shy away from the fact that I'm younger than most directors. Um, I think there's been only a handful of directors that um, were appointed uh, under the age of 40. Uh, it's happened before me, it will happen after me, but it's not something that the field has always uh, come to terms with. Um, you know, and so you sometimes see, you know, the newer perspective, the newer approach class clash uh, with some of the older perspective and some of that traditional, um, the traditional status quo. Um, and I think, um, you know, the other the other obstacle I would just mention uh, that the industry really faces. And so it, I've faced it in my role, my leadership roles, especially is really the, the public perception of corrections. Um it, you know, publicly, regardless of what a lot of people think or say or do, the public perception is negative. Um, it's an inherently negative industry, uh, ripe with negative headlines and negative situations. And so, you know, it, it's a very closed off society uh, in terms of fitting in. Um, so publicly, when people ask you what you do for a living, um, you know, oftentimes you'll find corrections people don't speak about it um, because it it oftentimes creates kind of this negative conversation. And so that's that's an obstacle that that you encounter in this industry that you just have to work through. And, you know, it's become a mission of mine to really start changing that public perception to identify how we can do good work. And can you tell me, is there uh, one moment or perhaps one day that stands out as a highlight? of your career? And if so, what would it be? Yeah, there's a, uh, there's a lot, you know, it's, I've been in the field 19 years and a lot of great things, a lot of great people. I think, you know, the, definitely the highlight for me at this point, um, you know, has been uh, the, the appointment as director here in Arizona. Um, you know, it's really, it's really hard to describe, uh, you know, working, 
I've, I've worked my entire career to get to a point like this where you get the opportunity to lead an agency um, and have the trust of, you know, in this case, Governor Hobbs here in Arizona um, to really pick me out of the group to be the person that, you know, she appoints to lead the agency, especially at, at what uh, has been a, a pretty tumultuous time uh, across the state. Um, so I think that, that that process, that interview process or the phone call conversation, the in-person interview with the governor, um, you know, I think that really has to stand out as my highlight so far of my career uh, because it, I really, I found that process and everything it entailed to really be kind of the culmination of what I've worked for. It, it's brought together my education, it's brought together my work experience, it's, it's brought together the commitment of my family. Um, all of it uh, to, to be appointed to this position. Well, the governor certainly made the right choice. Thank but you. Uh, can you tell us what a day in your life looks like today, and what is it you do during a during a typical day? <laughs> um, that's a, that's another great question. Um, and uh, every day is every day is different. I can tell you that's one of the things that I love about the, the work in corrections is you can never predict your day. Um, you know, for the most part. As the agency director, it entails uh, a combination of, you know, agency specific meetings, um, you know, where we're, we're talking about policy, uh, personnel, budgets, those sorts of, you know, public administration sort of um, tasks. Um, it also comes with, uh, it now comes with a lot of public appearances, public speeches, public attendance of certain events, um, because the role of director has has um, some level of a political component to it. And I say that in a non, um, you know, bipartisan political environment, just, uh, and so that, that encompasses a good amount of my schedule. Um, I also spend a lot of time touring facilities and our offices. For me, it's really important that I not be uh, an agency director who sits behind a desk all the time. Um, I, I value being out in the field really, um, talking with staff, getting to know the operations uh, at a firsthand perspective, talking with the uh, incarcerated population, getting out in the local community. And so in a state like Arizona, where we have a total of 16 different complexes uh, across the state and a large state, I spent a lot of time on the road um, to, to make that happen. Um, you know, the, the typical day is also 24-7. A lot of people don't understand that. Um, you know, and for me, um, I consider myself to be probably one of the more hands-on directors uh, because I want, I feel a personal responsibility for what happens here at the agency, good and bad. And so for me, I want to know what's going on. Um, and so when there's negative incidents, when there's, when there's things that happen um, 24-7, 365, um, I'm getting phone calls, I'm getting messages, we're having meetings about them. Um and so it's, it's a very 24 seven role. Um, and then I, you know, I would just say it, uh, I spent a lot of the time in conversation um, every day, regardless of the setting, really just challenging the status quo. Um, and so whether it's a meeting with my senior leadership team or it's a meeting out in a facility, talking with the population or in the community, you know, a lot of what I'm what I'm doing is asking why and challenging for us to think differently. Um, and so that's that's really the approach I bring into those conversations and, and through that daily schedule. Thank you. And um, I also have a few students submitted questions. Uh, they may be a little more, shall we say, philosophical than practical. But here's the first one. What do you think of the claim that underserved groups are overrepresented in prisons and in jails today? And does the term overrepresented equate with overt discrimination? Or might there be reasons other than actual discrimination for the overrepresentation of certain groups that we see in prison and other correctional uh, programs today? Yeah, you know, we uh, we definitely see that um, that certain populations are overrepresented in prisons and jails. Um, there's there's absolutely no debating that fact. Um, statistically, numerically, um, you know, you can quickly look at a population in any given state 
and see that um, you know the groups impacted by the overrepresentation are there. Um, and what's interesting is the overrepresentation really varies over time, um, but also across different policy focuses and also geographically. And so, you know, the the overrepresentation of a certain population or populations that I experienced in Maine, or even dating back to South Dakota, um, is different than what we're seeing here in Arizona. Uh, and so, there's a lot of factors that contribute that. When we when we trace back, you know, the really the origins of corrections centuries ago, and we look at really the, the starting of the prison system, you, you can definitely see, you can definitely identify points in time um, in which, you know, policy decisions were made um, in which this overrepresentation uh, started. You know, you can trace back to uh, some roots back to slavery. You can trace back to roots in uh, religious movements, drug policies, you know, among many other um, areas um, where you see this overrepresentation. Um, you know, I think it becomes a, a philosophical argument whether it's it's overt discrimination or not. I think it's hard, you know, for me sitting here in 2023 to challenge some of the motivations behind these decisions decades or even centuries ago. So for me, what's most important really is you know, we acknowledge that that this is this is reality. This is fact today um, and that we do everything we can to really confront it. Um, you know, we really for me, it's my responsibility to ensure that the population under my care, under my custody, which in Arizona is about thirty four thousand uh, men and women. It's my responsibility to ensure that they're provided the necessary uh, service connection, the necessary access to opportunities, the necessary conditions um, to live within uh, in order to have what we would all consider to be a, at least an opportunity for a successful future. Um, that's, that's what we have the ability to impact going forward, regardless of the history that led us here, right, wrong, or indifferent, which again, really becomes a philosophical discussion. We have what we have today, which includes populations that are overrepresented uh, overrepresented, we have to make sure that what we do with them while they're in our care, when they're in our custody, is meaningful so that when they do release back into our communities, we can have some confidence that they have the tools they need to stay there and really have a, a better impact in those communities. And you know, today it seems as though prison populations nationwide have begun to uh, decline. Is reducing prison populations a goal that you share? And if so, do you fear that it might contribute to an increase in crime? Yeah, we definitely have a large uh, prison population nationally, uh, without a doubt. Um, and some, some states are seeing an increase. Um, some states are really on the, uh, the tail end of significant reductions that we saw uh, over the last several years due to the pandemic. Um, you know, here in Arizona, they saw almost a 10,000 uh, person decline over the, the course of the pandemic. And so you start seeing a little bit of an uptick happening now. Um, you know, and I think, you know, some of the logic is that uh, if we reduce the population, um, you know, you reduce it by releasing those individuals who you would consider to be lower risk towards public safety to move out into the community. Um, before their term of imprisonment's over. I think that for me, um, you know, the only way that you reduce prison populations in a sustainable manner is by providing effective interventions during the period of incarceration um, and make sure that, that that period of incarceration is focused on rehabilitation and focused on providing that level of skill set that allows for a good connection back to the community. Like, to me, that's the smart policy approach. Um, because today, you know, if you were to go to, you know, any state and just have a widespread emptying of the prisons or even doing it methodically over a period, of, a short period of time, just to reduce the population, I think you will see uh, many unintended consequences that, that nobody's ready for. Um, and so, it becomes, for me, the conversation becomes less about reducing that population in a 
in a short term manner. And it becomes about what we can do over a longer period of time to better release people out of our complexes, out of our facilities so they don't come back and see that impact the population in a positive way going forward. And as you note, uh, prison populations have begun to come down, but now we're seeing uh, something of a, an increase uh, once again after COVID and so on. But many states in this context are facing a shortage of correctional officers. Is that also true in your state? And if so, what are you doing to address the problem? Yeah, the staffing, staffing shortages is an industry-wide uh, problem, an industry-wide issue. Um, it's something that myself and, and my colleagues uh, around all the other states uh, talk about a lot and strategize about a lot. Um, and not, you know, every state is different. Every state economy and, and employment, unemployment is, is different. Um, you know, we here in Arizona, we are on the, the benefit uh, right now of seeing some really healthy recruitment and retention numbers over the last uh, eight months or so. Um, where our, our vacancy rate is um, at a very low rate, would, and I consider a low rate today to be about 18% vacant. Um, and so you can kind of put that in perspective to where we've been as, a, as an agency in a field. Um, I, but for me, the, you know, the strategy really involves several things. One is we have to look at providing a livable wage and a, a, com, a wage that's commensurate with the amount of risk and uh, effort that it entails to work in corrections. And so, you know, luckily here in Arizona over the last uh, three years, they've seen um, upwards of 20 to 25% increases in some of their uh, correctional officer salaries. Um, but uh, equally important and sometimes even more important than just the, the financial side of the job is we have to make sure that the culture and the environment that our staff are working in are healthy. Um, you know, we could pay people everything possible, but if they're coming into an environment that is not healthy, is not well kept, doesn't have a strong positive culture, doesn't allow them to really make a meaningful impact um, and puts them in, you know, in harm's way, you know, more susceptible to violence. Um, if we're not focusing on that, we're not going to have a longer term sustainable outcome. And so a lot of our focus here is really on wellness um, is really on that environmental component to really help staff not just join the department, but want to stay here and, and feel like they're making a meaningful contribution while they're with us. And uh, there's a second part to that question that was uh, submitted, and it is, uh, do you ever have any uh, problem corrections officers? And if so, how do you identify them? And uh, what's the best way to handle them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, just like any other industry, um, you know, we, we could name any industry in the, in the, in the country. Um, and you always have uh, staff, you always have individuals who, uh, you know, you know, I would, we would consider to be problematic to use the, the, the term in the question. Um, and that can range from, um, you know, just deceitful practices. It could, it could mean, you know, bringing in contraband, it could be um, sharing information that shouldn't be shared. I mean, it can range a uh, wide range of things. It could be showing up or to, to work chronically late. Um, and so we have a very objective and structured means of addressing those through administrative inquiries, administrative investigations. And, and we provide a level of discipline, a level of response that's again, commensurate with whatever the behavior is. Um, when we have, the more egregious acts, you know, we have an inspector general's office that is an independent office, uh, law enforcement arm of the agency that reports directly to me. Uh, and the inspector general has a team of sworn law enforcement officers, uh, criminal detectives who we utilize to investigate crimes that we suspect occur in our uh, across our correctional system. And so that could entail uh, crimes that we believe are being committed by staff. And it also entails crimes that are committed by uh, the uh, incarcerated population. And so when we have those situations happen, um, the, the criminal investigation unit under the inspector general's office does that investigation and uh, pursues criminal charges, makes arrests, 
Um, and we ultimately end up terminating staff in a case like that. And then they are booked at the local county jail, um, just like anybody else who commits a crime. And so that's kind of the range of things that's occur that occurs, um, you know, from lowest discipline issues to criminal criminal charges being filed. And uh, another student sent in a question. Uh, he says, Director Thornell, you have been described as a rising star. I think he listened to the beginning of this uh, interview uh, in the field of corrections. But uh, how do you know, or how did you know that a career in corrections was your calling? And did you ever doubt that it was your calling? Well, uh, first off, thank you. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Uh, you know, my I've been in the field for 19 years now, almost almost uh, at the 20 year mark. Um, you know, working in corrections, studying corrections, and really, um, you know, on this sort of rise through the industry. And you know, as I think back to that period of time, um, it, it's really been an aligning of the stars for me in terms of, you know, from my my early days in South Dakota, I was given a lot of uh, sizable opportunities that, that really were offered to me based upon my potential. Um, and my success has really, um, demonstrated to me that this has been my calling. I don't know that, um, I don't think I've always known, um, that it was my calling. I've always felt like working in corrections is where I belong. It's where I'm comfortable. Um, you know, from, I still remember my very first few days, you know, walking into the South Dakota State Penitentiary, um, not having any idea what I was going to encounter as a brand new corrections officer. Um, and, you know, I'll never forget those, but even, even in my hardest assignments that I've had over the, the nearly 20 years, um, even in the most like challenging of cultures that I've experienced, like I found myself, like I, I, I'm more committed today than I, than I've ever been in the past. It just, it, it really, corrections is really just who I am. Um, and I think what keeps me here, what keeps me from ever doubting that is, you know, there's so much, there's such significant work that needs to be done in the field, um, across the country. Um, there's just such an evolution, really a transformation that needs to happen. Um, every, every corner of this nation um, and my skill set really lends itself to achieving that. Um, and so I think that's what really keeps me satisfied where I'm at and, and keeps me really focused on this being what I'm going to do for, you know, my long-term career. Um, I just, I just find myself really fulfilled by this work and, and what is necessary to, to keep the transformation happening. Can you uh, be a little bit more specific and uh, give some examples of the kinds of things that perhaps need to be addressed in the field? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, the, the biggest picture sort of thing for me that needs to be addressed is the, really the cultural aspects of the field. Um, and I talk about this in terms of, there, you know, this power and control dynamic that is kind of inherent to corrections. Um, it was inherent to corrections when I started uh, in my corrections academy, uh, again, 19 years ago. Um, and it's this mentality that you have to use power, you have to use control to really gain compliance um, inside of a prison. Um, and that's really a mentality that is only, you know, somewhat necessary for, you know, the two to four percent of the population that is actively violent, actively criminal while they're incarcerated. For the most part, you know, what I find and what I'm really working to change in the field is if you simply empower, you know, through respect, building rapport, having strong communication skills and, and having meaningful engagement, meaningful opportunities for people, that's how you get the best outcomes. Um, and so, you know, that, that might sound very general, but it's really applicable to every aspect of what we do as, a, as an industry, whether we're talking about, you know, how we provide food services in our prison system and the types of food that we provide and how it's delivered, whether we talk about the educational resources that we need to be making available and how our case management staff interact 
to promote those opportunities and encourage people to participate, whether we're talking about how we enforce the rules in a very respectful manner that allows us to utilize rapport to get the intended outcomes that we're seeking. Um, you know, we can look at our discipline processes and our grievance processes. They're ripe with this sort of power and control mentality where you just have to do what we say because we can tell you what to do. And if you don't do what we want you to do, we're going to punish you in some further way. That doesn't get us the outcomes that we want. It doesn't put people back into our society in a better way. Um, and so that's really what I, that's really what I challenge the field to do differently. Um, and it, it oftentimes comes with this label of, you know, you're, you're soft on corrections or, you know, you're more focused on the inmate population than, than others. And which isn't the case. Um, it's a very sort of short-sighted view of it. Really what I, what I try to let people know is if we truly want to impact public safety, the way that we all say we want to, we need to put out a better individual than we received when they came to prison. That's the only meaningful way to truly impact long-term public safety. And so if we really mean that as our goal, then we have to do things differently while we have them incarcerated with us in order to put them out in a better position than they came in. Um, and that's what I'm trying to promote every stop uh, along my career path. And that's what I'm really trying to impart here in Arizona um, across the system. I believe what you say is very insightful and certainly forward uh, thinking. Would it be possible today to democratize more of what goes on in, in prisons, perhaps allow inmates, uh, residents, the opportunity to make some choices with regard to, uh, oh, I know something as simple as maybe meals or some of the rules and regulations that are imposed uh, or give them wider choices than they have now? Yeah, you know, I think, I think the idea of giving them a voice is absolutely what we need to, we need to start embracing differently. Um, and it's not giving them a voice to where, you know, they become equals with staff or they then, you know, the traditional line of thinking that they then have power and get one over on you sort of thing. Really, the idea of giving them a voice is, you know, trying to create almost a sense of community, right? So these individuals live in these environments 24-7, 365, oftentimes working with the same staff every day. Um, without any say in what goes on. And so as we talk about trying to promote respect and rapport, and we talk about things like food services or access to other um, opportunities and activities, if we want to make those meaningful, we need to have their input. We need to give them a forum to voice that uh, input and debate it back and forth in a very healthy sort of manner. Um, you know, I don't want to offer 10 different new activities if there's no interest in the population in participating in those activities. And if I'm looking to create an efficiency in how we deliver food services or the, the healthy meal choices that we offer, getting their input makes sense. Right. And, and we've been able to show in different environments that just creating sort of a town hall environment uh, and discussion allows for a much more meaningful conversation. Um, so a long, long-winded way of saying, I think giving them a voice can really take us further into the future. And, and it doesn't mean that we have to compromise safety or security. In fact, I would argue that it can actually promote better safety and security uh, just through a different means. Yeah, I, I love the concept of uh, giving residents a voice. Uh, in terms of another question, how do practices and facilities in your state differ from, say, a typical state correctional system, if at all? Yeah, great question. Uh, you know, every every state is different in in a variety of ways. Um, I will tell you one of the one of the biggest differences that I've found here in Arizona than uh, every other state that I've worked in is the physical design of the correctional facilities. And here we call them complexes because they're truly 
they're they're truly like a campus complex um, and they're spread out across hundreds of acres of desert where you have very small housing units um, that make up a, a very large scale campus. It's unlike what you see in almost every other state. Um, and so you have a lot of different physical plant uh, challenges. You have a lot of challenges related to the climate because uh, it's obviously rather hot and dry here. Um, and so that's one significant difference and really causes a different deployment of staff and a different deployment of resources um, to accommodate that just widespread and vast sort of complex structure. Um, and then, there, you know, there's a lot of uh, policy differences um, that really, I just, the, the system kind of has lagged behind, um, you know, and so there are things we're working on today where we're trying to uh, improve the training that's available to staff. You know, staff are simply seeking training in, um, you know, uh, working with mentally ill individuals and really like mental health first aid sort of training, um, some fundamental use of force training, um, you know, training on uh, a legitimate grievance process. Um, and so there's all these different areas where we have a structure in place here, very similar to structures that have been around in corrections, but they necessarily haven't evolved the way that um, we've seen in other systems. And so those are some of the key areas that we have differences um, here. And other areas in, in restrictive housing practices or what we've traditionally been considered solitary confinement. Um, you know, and so we've been able to just in the first um, eight months, almost nine months of me being here, just by changing some of our policies and how we approach that idea of solitary confinement, we've reduced that population by over 80%. Um, since January by simply changing our approach. Um, and so those are just some examples. And some people do say that prisons are kind of a last resort for mentally ill people. Oftentimes you have nowhere else to send them effectively and they end up uh, in prisons. So what can we do with people who do require uh, greater mental health resources perhaps than even you can offer? And is there some other way in which we should address the needs of these people? Yeah, you know, it's, I'll tell you, the, the, the mentally ill population, um, you know, it's really reflective of probably the, the, the biggest gap in services, the biggest, I, I, would, I would say the biggest failure of our social structure, our social system, um, because you're right, it, Prison is really the last stop for a lot of these men and women who have a severe mental illness. Um, and it's often, you know, been compounded by an inability to get to services before incarceration, which, you know, might might contribute to homelessness, might contribute to what, you know, their crime, their situation. Um, and then they end up incarcerated and the incarcerated environment doesn't help. Right. And the access to services is oftentimes lacking because prison systems were not designed to house such a high level of mental illness in the population. Um, you know, and so every day here in Arizona, we're strategizing how to change, you know, the use of a housing unit to accommodate more severely mentally ill individuals, how to expand our staffing resources to provide mental health services, medication services. Um, and then maybe the biggest gap of all is when these individuals are preparing for release, trying to find those services in the community that can help with a sustained transition back into the local community is a significant challenge. Um, and so it's a, you know, I would say of all of kind of the, the social structures in place that impact corrections, that, the, the, the mental health system is probably the one that has caused the most pain for the correction system overall. Right. And we do have some questions uh, coming in from, from the audience. And one of them is, uh, what are the most critical supportive factors for an offender's reentry into their community upon release? Yeah, that's a, that's an excellent question. Um, 
and it, you know, in some ways it depends on the individual, right? Um, everybody comes from a little bit of a different walk of life, but we do know that, you know, housing is critically important first and foremost. Um, you know, every day that somebody goes without a stable placement, um, whether it's a, a personal residence or a group residence, every day they go without that, uh, their risk for committing another crime or coming back to prison goes up. Um, and the same goes with employment. Um, you know, we know that every ounce of education effort and vocational training effort that we put into somebody while they're incarcerated pays dividends when they release into the community because they're more likely to find a job with a livable wage. And then they're, if, if they're successful in that, they're less likely to return to incarceration. So I would say those are by far the two most important factors from a, a more of a general perspective. Um, but we also know that connection to substance use disorder treatment and really a primary care physician um, are critically important as well. So if you leave incarceration without the necessary uh, counseling services in place, perhaps medication assisted treatment services in place, and instead, if you fall back into the world and the cycle really of addiction, um, you know, we know in today's, today's time, that's going to lead potentially to a tragic outcome with what we have uh, on our streets. Um, and the connection to a primary care physician is critically important to, you know, carry continuity for many healthcare services that they were receiving while incarcerated into the community. We know that like medication compliance um, allows for stability and sustainability for that individual. And so bridging that gap is critically important as well in, in terms of reentry efforts. Thank you. Uh, has the Arizona Department of Corrections ever operated under a consent decree? And are there any notable U.S. Supreme Court decisions that influence your work today? Yeah, uh, another great question. Um, I do not believe that, at least in the recent years, there has not been any uh, official consent decree Um here in Arizona, we do have, uh, and, and the, the asker of the question may be familiar with, um, I did, when I came into the position, um, it was on the heels of about 11 years of litigation against the department related to healthcare services and conditions of confinement in solitary confinement. Um, and it is now a case titled uh, Jensen versus Thornell. You can look it up. It's a federal court case. Um, and coming in, the case was on the brink of going into what's called receivership, uh, which would essentially allow the federal court to take over those aspects of the agency. We've seen this in some other states that has happened. Uh, what I was able to do is, is work with the plaintiffs in that case and negotiate what's called a federal court injunction, um, which allows the federal court uh, through court monitors to hold us to a standard of care, a standard of service delivery, in these specific areas for a period of time. And the court monitors work with us to make sure that we're doing the things that we agreed to be doing. And then at some point down the road, when we've demonstrated substantial compliance in an ongoing manner, then the court will step out of that and the permanent injunction will be lifted from us. Um, so that's in place right now. Uh, it's been in place since April 7th of this year when we successfully uh, negotiated that agreement. And uh, we're working every single day very hard to uh, ensure substantial compliance with that, again, in the areas of medical care, uh, mental health care, and uh, solitary, solitary confinement practices. And before we uh, switch back to Rachel, are there uh, any other comments you'd like to make or any observations that you'd like to share with people who are listening today? Yeah, if I could, you know, I would, I would just put a plug in for the field of corrections. Um, you know, obviously, it, it's been my 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 life. Really, the it, it's what I think one of the questions that's is probably what people would consider to be my calling. It's what I love to do. Um, but a lot of people, a lot of students, especially, um, really don't think of it as a career. They don't think of it as something that you can do from a public service standpoint long term. Oftentimes, it's viewed as more of a stepping stone. Uh, which is which is a mistake I was making when I was 19 or 20 years old entering into the field of criminal justice. Um, 
I would share that it's really the opposite of that. Corrections is a profession um, that makes a meaningful contribution to the community, to society, and really has a key role in ensuring public safety. Um, and it's exciting. You know, the, the things that we encounter every single day um, include things like law enforcement, which is a traditional draw for people, includes things like uh, the, the courts and legal aspects, uh, but it also includes behavior change and behavior modification and, and security practices. And so, you know, we, we're a field that's ripe for good students, good employment, and a good career. Um, and so for me, it's important to just share that message because it doesn't get said often. Uh, and people oftentimes dismiss it as, as something uh, to look forward to. But it's really, for me, it's a land of opportunity, a land of great potential. And uh, it's a field that's, I think, at a point where it's starting to shift and move in a very positive direction. And I hope that excites other people as much as it excites me. Well, thank you. And in fact, uh, I really appreciate your being here today because I've been around for a while and I've had some uh, exposure to rather traditional notions, but uh, you have a lot of insight. And the insight that you've chosen to share with us today, I think is, is very valuable. I think it's the future. And uh, I'll certainly be following your uh, career and your actions as, as things go forward. But let me call on Rachel. Uh, Rachel, do you have any other uh, questions perhaps from the audience or any closing comments? Well, I, I would say um, I can feel your excitement to Director Thornell. So thank you for all the work you're doing in corrections and for being with us here today. And thank you, Frank. And thank you to everyone in our audience that has joined as well. I've learned a lot listening to the conversation. I'm sure that everyone on the call has benefited as well. So thank you again. Thank, thank you for having me. Thank you.